So last week, um, we saw what was happening. We talked about what was happening up in Antioch, that Syrian city. A Gentile church had been planted. Uh, we called it uh, Antioch Christian Church. At least I did. I don't know why I said we. I did. Anyway, the church was exploding. The Gentile mission in the book of Acts was fully underway, fulfilling um, Luke's intent to show that the gospel spreading from Jerusalem would make it all the way to Rome, where Theophilus was. And it was to Theophilus that Luke wrote the book of Luke to give him an orderly account of what happened when Jesus came to this earth and to continue the story in the book of Acts to tell Theophilus, hey, this is how the gospel started. It started with Jesus and it ended up with you in Rome. And so we saw all of that shift take place on a large scale last week in the book of Acts. But then some questions came up, like, what does this mean for the church? And what does it mean for the mission to the Jews? Because now Gentiles are included. And you know, Jews and Gentiles just don't mix. So there was a lot of questions that were flying around at this time. This week, then in chapter 12, and, and I'm sorry, this is a most fascinating chapter. And I'm totally intrigued by it. And there is absolutely no way that I can do this chapter justice. It is a piece of art. It is a work of art. It is a masterpiece of skill in writing in every way. In ways that I haven't even discovered yet. Let alone be able to tell you in a short period of time. This is a beautiful chapter. A story within a story. And I hate to divide it up which wasn't my original intent. That's why you see five points in your bulletin. But I'm going to have to. And you're going to have to come back next week. And you're going to have to like it. Because in the process, God, um, I think, is going to change our lives. So now today, these stories about what's going to happen to the church, the Gentile mission, what's it going to look like, the Jewish mission, what's the church going to look like? It goes from Antioch, 300 miles back down south to Jerusalem. And we're introduced, reintroduced some, to some old characters. And then we get a glimpse into the life of a few new characters as well. And as the final scenes of this section of the book unfold, right before our eyes, in the process of seeing Luke's masterful storytelling, we see all kinds of irony and contrast and even humor. But above all that, we see the unstoppable nature of the church. God is not done with the Jews just because Luke is not going to write that much more about it after this in the book. And God has also, we see, has just launched the mission to the Gentiles and it won't stop. As a matter of fact, it goes to the end of the book and there's no ending, no ending to the book, no formal ending to the book which means the story continues, which means we are spiritual heirs of the rest of the book. We get to join the story, the unstoppable story of an unstoppable God and his unstoppable Christ as members, as brothers and sisters of his unstoppable church to take the unstoppable message that we hear and hear out to there so we can bring them into here so they can be part of the church as well. My goal today was to do the whole chapter, but as I said, it ain't going to happen. No way. So we'll go as far as we can, and then we'll let the Lord do the rest. So let's begin Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. And we're going to see that a new character emerges on the scene. And my first point is this. A king attacks. It was... About this time, Luke starts the chapter, verse 1. It was about this time, about 43 or 44 A.D., 
During the events towards the end that we just read about in Acts chapter 11, the Gentile mission was exploding. Antioch Christian Church was growing. Jews and Gentiles together became known as this separate entity, this movement. And they were called Christians. And they were pastored by two old friends, Barnabas and Saul. And then word comes to Antioch by way of an itinerant prophet named Agabus who warns of an impending famine that's getting ready to sweep across the Roman world. So with a newfound, vibrant Christian faith and a heart full of encouragement, ready to be shared with generosity, the brothers and sisters, the Gentile brothers and sisters of Antioch Christian Church take up an offering, pre-famine aid, for the poorer Jewish brothers and sisters at Jerusalem First Assembly. Remember, they had some issues already of their own. They pooled their resources and gave to the poor. Now if a famine hits, they're in serious trouble. So Antioch, those believers there, they're probably a little bit more wealthy. The church is large and growing. They're excited. It's new. So they knock down every social, cultural, racial barrier in an effort to reach out to their brothers and sisters in need just because they're Christians which should speak to us as well. God has designed a plan for believers to come to the aid, no matter what, of one another. And none of this superficial stuff should be getting in the way. They modeled this Christian hallmark that should follow us, should haunt us every day that we live and move on this earth as believers in Jesus Christ. If God gave his son so that we might be saved, how much more should we give to those who've also had the opportunity to believe in him? And that's what they did. No questions asked, without distinction. They just gave. And so when they, they take up an offering and they send this offering, they gave this offering, they sent Barnabas and Saul, their pastors, down to Jerusalem with the gift. It was about this time, in other words, meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, that King Herod, a new but short-lived character, he was part Jew, I can't spend too much time on him, intriguing character. He was part Jew and part Idumean, who kept the Jewish law rigorously, but curried favor with the Romans. He was a typical politician playing both sides of the aisle. And he was a master at it. Matter of fact, historians say he was quite charming and able to pull it all off. He is the grandson, this King Herod, known as Agrippa I. He's the grandson of a Hasmonean princess, which means she was Jewish. She was from Jewish aristocracy. The Hasmonean family were priests that took the lead in the intertestamental period. And it's from this family that comes Judas the Maccabee, who leads a revolt against the Greeks and pushes them out. She is in that royal line now, which is really no royal line because She's from the priestly line, but they usurped power. Here she comes, and she marries a Jewess, marries an Idumean, who becomes Herod the Great. An Idumean is a descendant from Esau, Jacob's brother. Israel is a descendant of Jacob. An Idumean is a descendant of Esau. Brothers who put their differences to rest. But if you read the story of the Old Testament, you find out when their Jewish brothers, when their Israeli brothers needed help, the descendants of Esau, the Idumeans, saw the need but refused to help. There's bad blood between these two groups. And yet they come together Surprise, Herod the Great. Surprise, he's a jealous king. He has people put to death, even his own kids, because he's so jealous. This is the same guy, Herod the Great, 
the grandfather of King Herod that we're talking about here that tried to have Jesus put to death. Not only that, his sister is Herodias. It's weird. He's the nephew, then, of Herod Antipas, or Herod the Tetrarch, that we also read about in the Gospels. And remember, those two colluded to have John the, John the Baptist beheaded. This guy comes from a crazy family. That's his lineage. He's known as Herod Agrippa I. King Herod, what do you think he's going to do? The master politician with, I mean, this is Herod Agrippa. He has some people belonging to the church arrested, and he begins to persecute them. That's his intention. So here you have this outbreak of the Gentile church and all these questions floating around about what the church is going to look like. It's made its way back to Jerusalem. His power is contingent upon his ability to be able to keep the peace wherever he rules. So what does he do? He launches a persecution effort against believers in Jesus in Jerusalem for political gain. To shore up his political power. The masses are generally hated by the king and actually his whole family. Obviously, we've heard about a little bit about his history. So Agrippa I made special efforts to win Jewish affection. His favor with Rome depended on how well he kept the peace in Israel. That meant advancing the majority, which would be the Jews of the day in town, and rigorously suppressing the minorities, especially disruptive groups, like this new growing band called Christians. The strange mix of Jews and Gentiles. So Herod Antipas saw a cheap way to elevate his own reputation with his Jewish subjects and to stay in good with Rome. He took it and he launched a deliberate attack on the church to stop it dead in its tracks. Starting with two of its leaders. If you're going to stop the church, where do you start? You start with leadership. That's exactly what he did. Verse 2, he had James, the brother of John. So this is one of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Right, this is James. He's an apostle. Herod has him put to death. Apparently, the favor that the apostles had experienced earlier in the book has turned to hatred now because they have approved of table fellowship with Gentiles. You don't eat with Gentiles. They're apostates now. They're traitors to Judaism they are seen by Jewish leaders as idolaters because if you eat with somebody, you might be eating food offered to idols. Therefore, you are complicit in idol worship. And now, the leadership of the church has said that's okay. Apparently, if James is true to nature, he's a vocal advocate for this new Christian mix. He's a... He's somebody with a voice loud enough to stir up all kinds of disruptive behavior within the city to say, it's okay for believers, even Jewish believers, to eat with Gentiles. I mean, remember, he was one of the sons of thunder. He wasn't afraid to speak up. And apparently he spoke up and he was powerful enough and persuasive enough that he could cause a lot of trouble for Herod. So Herod targets him first and without due process, which is against the Jewish law, which, you know, political people always do if it's beneficial to them. They bypass the law and try to hold somebody else accountable for it. Sorry. King Herod shuts him down first in a way that pleases the Jews and according to their own law, by putting him to death by the sword as a troublemaking apostate, leading a whole town astray. According to Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 18, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. 
James and his brother John were inseparable in the Gospels. Now they are temporarily separated by death. It's very interesting. James, the first and only apostle martyr recorded in the New Testament, he goes right here. John, there's no record of his death. He outlives them all. Two brothers, the first one dead and the last one dies of old age. It's amazing how God chooses to use in his sovereignty different people for different periods of time. God is still the Lord of all, whether we understand it or not. He's still sovereign. He's still in charge, right? And so God uses these two brothers in different ways. Apparently, he's done with James. So he allows his life to be taken by being put to death by the sword. Again, like this is, this is so intricate. It's so incredible. If you go back and read from Deuteronomy chapter 13, what you find out is if a, even a family member tries to lead you astray, lead you into idolatry, worshiping other gods, without mercy, you're supposed to stone him to death and bring everybody along for the ride. Because God knows how dangerous it is when you start worshiping other gods within a body of believers. So he says you've got to put a stop to it. Now, the next paragraph after that in Deuteronomy says, if there's a troublemaker that has a loud enough voice to sway a whole town, kill him with the sword. That's exactly what happens here. So you see, apparently James had a loud enough voice to potentially sway a whole town. And so, according to their own Jewish law that Herod is well aware of, he has him put to death in that manner, which tells us why he did it the way that he did it. But it also tells us that he did it for political gain because if you shut him down, maybe you can shut the rest of the people down. He's covering his political backside, but in the process, he's actually fulfilling God's will because at the Last Supper, right before Passover, James and John and even their mom, these two brothers and their mom, they're getting in the mix about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom when Jesus takes authority and Jesus said, hey, you don't even know what you're asking. As a matter of fact, guys, can you drink of this cup? Can you be baptized with what I'm going to be baptized with? And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, sure, not knowing that he's going to have to suffer and die. Herod thinks he's doing himself a favor, but he's really an agent of God disguised as a devil on earth. Now, maybe he really is a devil on earth. He thinks he's just covering his backside. It's funny how God works. James was drinking the same cup that Jesus drank. And it hit the church hard, without a doubt. One of the original 12 ripped from the scene. One down, Herod thinks. One down that he thought might be in charge. Inflated by his success then, in murdering James, Herod grabbed the apparent leader of the Jerusalem First Assembly, a character who had already been in trouble with the Sanhedrin more than once. Verse 3, when he saw that, this met with approval among the Jews, that is putting James to death, he proceeded to seize Peter too, who had already been in trouble, like I said, with the Sanhedrin more than once for consorting, among other things, with Gentiles. He was a natural choice if Herod was going to systematically shut down the church. If he'll target the leaders, he will systematically uh, uh, target the rank and file members. So if he's coming for Peter, maybe he'll come for us. He may show up at our house tonight. He knows how to inflict terrorism to protect his political backside. And that's what he does here. And then Luke gives us a bit of chronology. He tells us when all of this happens. And then Luke says this. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. The seven day Jewish celebration. One of three annual feasts beginning at the day of Passover each spring. This is in the spring of 43 or 44. Celebrating, get this, Israel's deliverance from Egyptian captivity. The day the Lord set them free from their oppressors. 
Mosaic law required all males in Israel to attend the festival in Jerusalem to remember what the Lord had done in setting them free all those years ago. Luke is telling us that the city then, because of the Mosaic law, would have been teeming with thousands of worshiping visitors. A perfect time for a crooked politician to grandstand for the crowd. <laughs> if ever there was a time, now's the time. I'm going to make an open show of these guys and shut everything down. But he has to throw Peter in jail, as we find out, because to have him killed during this time would have probably thrown the whole city into an uproar. People wouldn't have known what was going on. So he's smart. He knows the Jewish bit. And so rather than killing him, now unleavened bread is hit. It's initiated with Passover, followed by a seven-day festival. Right? He knows he can't touch Peter, so he's going to throw him in prison um, after we find out. Verse 4 says this. After arresting him, he put him in prison. And this is not the common prison that Peter was probably in before that he escaped from and caused great embarrassment to the Sanhedrin in chapter 5. This is probably the more secure prison in the local Roman fortress. This is a military barracks prison. Soldiers all around. There's Peter. Herod says, listen, I know your history. I know you got out before. You embarrassed the Jewish leadership, but you're not doing it to me. So I'm going to throw you in this prison. He takes no chances. He doubles down and he hands him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. Four soldiers at a time, round the clock. Three times a day, they rotate in and rotate out. Herod intended to bring him up for a public trial after the Passover. So for seven days, he's just going to keep him locked up. And he's going to have him guarded with twice as many guards as you would normally have. He's not taking any chances. After this time period then, after Passover proper, proper and the seven additional days, so eight days all in total for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Peter was imprisoned. I mean, this is so ironic. Peter is imprisoned during Passover, right, by an evil oppressor, a religious celebration, remembering the day that the Lord set his people free from their captors. A festival King Herod himself would have celebrated. Herod is celebrating the very feast and he has somebody locked up. The Lord set the people free and he locks somebody up. What does he think is going to happen? How arrogant. He would put on a public trial with every intent to find him guilty and execute him. But, as we find out, don't you know? The Lord delivers. Especially when his people pray. And now is as good a time as any. Now in one short sentence then, Luke skillfully juxtaposes, places side by side, the seemingly unlimited power of the oppressor, King Herod. So Peter was kept in prison. And the power of the church juxtaposed against that. But the church was earnestly, with their only available weapon, praying to God for him, the powers that be, with helpless people praying to the power that is. In continuous, united prayer, the church is interceding for Peter. Prayer may be the only weapon they have, but it is more than enough because its guarantee, its guarantor is the Lord. You get that? The power is not in the prayer. <laughs> the power is in the one you're praying to who guarantees that he'll answer. It's the natural atmosphere of God's people and the normal context for divine activity in the book of Acts. And Luke's make, Luke makes sure that he includes that time and time again in his stories. I love what the great pastor uh, Chris Well says. As the church prays, the whole universe looks down upon this little group interceding for the life of their chief apostle. God looks down upon it. The angels look down upon it. The hosts of heaven look down upon it. The powers that be, the ages look down upon it. 
The real battlefield where the decisive events of time and history are decided is in the faithful group of followers of the Lord who down on their knees are praying without ceasing to God if extended, fervent, united prayer is not the church's first resort in a time of crisis. The church reveals that it is ultimately depending on something else or someone else other than God. And so as if to test the church's faith, to limit and to emphasize, to push their faith to the limit and to emphasize God's consummate power over his enemies, the Lord waits to act until the eve of Peter's show trial and probable summary execution. It's a done deal. So here, Herod thinks he's in control. The church, they don't know what to do. They pray. God doesn't deliver Peter right away. He's got a plan. And it stretches their faith as they pray. But he does so to demonstrate his power in all of their anxiousness, in all of their prayer. God is still in control. Verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. <laughs> Crazy. Bound with not one, which is normally, I mean, you would think, is enough, but with two chains and centuries stood guard at the entrance. Unnecessary, unpretentious overkill. By his sleep, though, which some of you are doing right now, Peter models a deep trust in the sovereignty of God, so I applaud your faith. You don't know it, though, because your eyes are closed. And apparently your ears are, too. Peter's asleep. The next day he could be put to death, and he knows it. No, he's going to be put to death, and he knows it, and yet he's asleep. He'd already experienced one miraculous escape from prison, so he knew that God could do that if he chose. If not... He had no intention of accommodating Herod's violence by making a scene on what could be the last day of his life. He's not going to resort to his own power to try to get himself set free. He's just going to go to sleep, and he's going to rest in the Lord. While Herod takes extraordinary measures to lock Peter down, what he's doing is he is betraying his inherent insecurity in the face of this movement. Peter's at peace. Herod's uptight. <laughs> how ironic. I, I can't tell you guys how many times this happens in this story. Lucas, he blows me away. The Holy Spirit like, said, oh, I got a good guy to write this time. <laughs> and Luke just puts this together. And by the time you realize this, you know what? If you're reading it, you know what you say to yourself? Because we all talk to ourselves. Peter does. We'll find out in a minute. <laughs> I feel a miracle coming on. Verse 7, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. It goes from pitch black to being lit up by the presence of an angel, one who has been in the very presence of God. And with a twist of humor, we don't know what happened to the guards. Apparently they're left in the dark. We don't know. And Peter peacefully sleeping right through this whole divinely inspired prison break up to this point. He's getting ready to be touched by an angel and he doesn't even know it. So what does the angel do? He struck Peter on the side, either with a kick in the ribs or a good push on the side and woke him up. And Peter's like, what? So in Passover fashion, the angel orders him to hurry up and to get ready to leave. I mean, think about the Exodus story, right? What does God tell the people to do? Here's what I want you to do on the night of the Passover. Put your clothes on. Get your shoes on. Get ready to go because I'm going to take you out. As a matter of fact, don't even put any leaven in your bread for the journey for, or for the meal because you're not going to have time to let it rise. Unleavened bread. The angel shows up and said, Peter, get your clothes on. He's like, Pfft. I don't even know what you're talking about, man. What in the world's going on? Imagine if you were in jail sleeping and an angel woke you up. You probably wouldn't know what was going on at first. And so the angel has to continue. Quick, get up, he said. And as he did, the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Either, evidentially, right, neither the angel nor Peter touched the chains. They came off because God himself was setting him free. And apparently, 
He was still half asleep because the angel had to tell him what to do. I must be dreaming. This sounds like what the Lord told Moses to tell all them at the Passover to do. Right? I'm, I'm just, I'm dreaming. Okay, it's Passover. I've done this before, just a few chapters ago. I got this. Then the angel said to Peter, I mean, like, it's like a parent trying to wake up a kid for school, right? Put your clothes on and your sandals. Yep, I'm dreaming. This is Exodus all over again, man. This is Passover. But Peter was obedient and he did so. So he's still out of it. He's like a kid trying to wait. He's fumbling around. He manages to get his shirt and shoes on. But he has to be reminded to put his coat on too. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. He's awake enough by this point, apparently, to follow orders. And so that's exactly what he does. But did, but according to the text, he had no idea what the angel was doing and that it was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. <laughs> I remember when I was in that other town down in Lydda and uh, she came down from heaven. Yeah, I know, I got this, I got this, remember? And as Peter follows the angel, they pass the first and the second guards. They stroll past two sets of guards like nothing's up. And they come to an iron gate, the last barrier, barrier, an ancient, gigantic iron gate leading to the city. And with dramatic effect, I mean, this happened 2,000 years ago, right? It mysteriously, miraculously opened for them like an automatic door. Like, just opened up all by itself. And they went through it. And when they had walked the length of a street, Just like he came, suddenly the angel left. And then Peter came to himself, verse 11 says. He woke up fully and figured out that all this had actually happened. Like he didn't know what was going on the whole time. Now, I'm in the, the cold air, just hit me in the face. I'm glad I got my coat on, but now I'm awake. Great. And he did what anybody would do. He started talking to himself. It's right here in the Bible. So that must be normal, at least somewhat normal. And he said, I mean, there's nobody else around. He's out in the you know, street in the middle of the night, skulking around. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping that would happen to me. This is amazing. A double deliverance from both political and religious oppression. What they meant for harm, pfft, God meant for good, Genesis 50. Now I know for sure the Lord has the same power to rescue now as he did when he delivered our forefathers from Egypt. But hey, no time to stop and ponder the past. Prison escapees need to stay on the move. And he knows exactly where he wants to go first. I bet they're going to be glad to see me. Well, not exactly. What happens is they end up being astonished. And this is so funny. It's sad. It's just like us. It's sad. But it's funny at the same time. The church that should be overjoyed to see Peter is actually astonished. And we're going to find out what that word means here in a second as I keep on moving on. You can see why there's no way I can make it through this whole chapter. It's so exciting. Ah. Verse 12 says, When this had dawned on him, realizing he would need to immediately skip town and go into hiding far away from Herod's reach, Peter stealthily raced through the dark city streets to where he knew the believers were likely gathered to tell them how the Lord had delivered him. And so he went to the house of Mary, new character, the mother of John. She's really not new if you read the Gospels. The mother of John, also called Mark, so here we're introduced with actually two characters. John Mark is only mentioned here in passing. He's the writer, he's the recorder for Peter. We know his writing, according to Peter's story, as the Gospel of Mark. Maybe this event with Peter's near-death experience, right, could have prompted them to say, hey, we better write this down because we never know what's going to happen to us. This could be one of the events that brought the Gospel of Mark about when it happened. Right? So here is John Mark. He's only mentioned here briefly. He pops up later. This is Luke's way of introducing him as an important figure not too long, in the not too long distant future in the movement of the church. 
He ends up with some other associates a short time later. Mary, this Mary, his mom, is one of the Marys in the Gospels. She's cousins with Barnabas. Nepotism has been around forever. According to Colossians 4. And apparently she is also then a member of the Levitical aristocracy. She's from the priestly tribe. Aristocracy. A wealthy widow, rich enough to own her own home, large enough to host a house church, maybe Peter's house church, which at the moment, with Peter in prison and James recently martyred, was serving as a venue where many people had gathered and were praying. And they probably had been all week. Tonight, probably more fervent than ever, knowing that Peter was probably going to be executed in the morning. And wouldn't you know it, right in the middle of their fervent Christian prayer, they get interrupted. Verse 13, Peter shows up and he knocks at the door. Peter knocked at the outer entrance. And a servant named Rhoda, which means Rosebud, came to answer the door. So Mary's house must have been, must have been large enough to have a vestibule in a hall, or a hallway out to the street, out to the outer door. And then an inner door where you entered into the main part of the house. She was wealthy. She had a servant named Rhoda. And Rhoda, when somebody knocks at the door, is just doing her job. And she goes out to answer the door. And, verse 14, when she recognized Peter's voice, so apparently she was probably part of the church, part of the whole mix of everything, she was so overjoyed. I mean, they've been praying about this for a week, right? She ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. Peter's like, what's up with that? She was so excited to hear Peter's voice that she forgot to open the door. She runs back to tell everybody else. And their response is so typical. It's so like us. They were praying for days that God would release Peter and send him back to them. Now God has done just that. And they were too stunned to believe it. God had just answered their prayer and they're like, what? They couldn't believe it. The sober, serious saints, hard at work, Praying for Peter's release. Failed to realize that the answer to their prayer was standing at the door trying to get in. They even went as far as to accuse, accuse the poor girl of being crazy. Look what verse 15 says. You're out of your mind. Girl, you must have apparently taken leave of your faculties. You've lost your senses, they told her. But when she kept insisting that it was so... They said, well, okay, okay, wrote it, it must be an angel. So because she went on and on, they speculated, maybe this is Peter's angel at the door. And that Peter had already been executed. Luke records it, but he doesn't give us any insight. He doesn't make any comment on it. Here's the deal. Evidently, Jewish superstition believed that guardian angels could appear. And look like the person that they had been guarding immediately after that person's death. That's what they're thinking, but nobody goes to the door to answer it. Instead, they all just sat around having a heated discussion over who was or who was not standing outside at the gate, pounded on the door. Sounds just like Christians. Here's an answer to prayer, and we want to sit around and argue about it. Verse 15. But all this time, Peter just kept on pounding and pounding on the door. And you have to wonder what was going on in Peter's normally impetuous mind at this point. Certainly his absence from prison would have been noticed soon, right? He's probably thinking, I'm standing here in the street, and the guards, are pro they probably know right where I'm going to go. I wonder if they picked up my scent yet. I'm pounding on the door. I'm making noise in the middle of the night. Rhoda comes and answers the door. She knows my voice. She freaked out. <sighs> Apparently, everybody else was so busy praying for me that they don't have time to come and let me in. I mean, I'm all for prayer, Lord. You know that. But they need to take a break and come let me in. And as Peter kept on knocking, someone finally came to the outer door, thinking it was going to be Peter's guardian angel. That's where this idea comes from. 
And the guardian angel would be, then be there to tell them about Peter's death. And so, when they opened the door and saw that it was really Peter, when, when they saw that it was really him and not a figment, figment of Rhoda's imagination or an angel, but that it was really Peter, they were astonished. They were beside themselves, flabbergasted, knocked off their feet. And apparently, they started going on about it, wouldn't you? And maybe... Some more nosy bugs came out to see what was going on because they were making such a commotion, right? It got so loud, verse 17, that Peter has to motion with his hand for them to be quiet. I'm standing in the street. People are going to be looking for me if they're not already. So he motions with his hand for them to be quiet once they're inside so that he can describe to them the, the miraculous details of his rescue from prison, how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He doesn't mention an angel. He said, the Lord delivered me. And with no time to waste, then Peter says, listen, you got to pass this on. Tell James, not the apostle James, he's dead, earlier in the chapter. This is Jesus' brother, James. You got to tell this James and the other brothers and sisters. Make sure the church knows about this. Singling James out means that he may have already been recognized as one of the leaders of Jerusalem First Assembly. And if he wasn't the leader yet, he would be. So Peter says, You got to tell James what's happened. You got to tell the brothers and sisters what happened. And then Peter left for another place. He left for parts unknown. He split. He got out of Dodge. I'm sure he didn't tell them where he was going. He just went into hiding, right? He's a fugitive. <laughs> it's so funny. I, I was looking for a place to fit this in, even though the spelling is a little different. And right after Passover, he went on the lamb. L-A-M. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, just perfect. Like, he's on the lamb. Parts unknown. Right after Passover, maybe headed to Antioch where he pops his head up in Galatians chapter 2. And he only appears one more time in the Acts narrative. Peter was officially moving out of direct leadership of the Jerusalem church. Peter was going to take charge, but God wasn't done with Peter yet. And so he rescued him. He delivered him when God's people pray, because that's what God does. What happened to Herod, you'll have to come back next week to find out. This episode raises the matter as to why God would rescue the Apostle Peter, but not James. It's hard to reckon from our perspective, and we struggle with this all the time. But God, as the book of Psalms says, God is in the heavens, and He does as He pleases. Sometimes it makes no sense to us, but we are the Lord's own and when his work for us is done, he takes us. If not, he'll move us out of Dodge if he has to. And that's what he did with Peter. Because every servant, brothers and sisters, is dispensable. Every leader must be ready for heaven. For any of us who belong to the Lord... This might be our last day. Or it might be the first of thousands. We don't know. That's up to God. And so what do we do in the meantime? We pray. Because that's what the church always does. And our God delivers. One way or the other. Because that's what He always does. And so, stand with me, if you will. Whew, ten minutes early. This is what I want us to do. There are some deliverances that need to take place. And we're going to pray. We're going to show that our allegiance is to God. And we're not going to rely on our wit, on our ability on all of those other things that we could rely on, but rather we're going to rely on God to come through at just the right time and bring a deliverance. So I want you to do more than just stand today. I want everybody to come to the front. And I want to lay out a couple of things that we need to pray about. So if everybody would just come up
to the altar. Let's pray. And most certainly, if you need to pray a personal prayer, I invite you to do that. But corporately, as those believers in that little house church, all those years ago, were fervently praying. That's what the rest of us are going to do. And this is what we're going to pray about. Tomorrow, this is like held us hostage for a year or more. It's drained me of so much energy. I'm not complaining, I'm just telling you a fact. As well as our leadership team, our, our board, most directly, we're going tomorrow to meet with the executive committee of the Evangelical Lutherans to discuss the purchase price of this building. Now we've had help and wisdom given from Greg, another friend. I'm so glad that you're here today, Greg. Thank you. It's good to see both of you. We've been praying. We've done everything that we can to prepare ourselves to go and meet with them. But we're going to trust that God is going to deliver us. And He's going to deliver this building to us for at least the price that they originally offered. Now, we understand negotiations might be in place, so I just want to lay that out before you. With the Lord on our side, we're not going to lose, however it turns out. It's our wish, right, Nadine, that we get this for nothing. So from a pastor perspective, if we end up with as much in the bank when we buy all this stuff, as we did when we started, then we bought it for nothing. I know it may not be true, but it sounds good in my mind. That's one deliverance we're going to pray for. Now, I woke up one night this week and I had pain in my right ear. And I already have some trouble with it. And I got nervous. And you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about the meeting on Monday, tomorrow. How am I going to be prepared if my ear is hurting? So I got up and got on my iPad and started looking for earache medicine. Make sure they still had some out there. But God delivered me. Now, speaking about when people pray and needing deliverance, I just found out today that John is having some kidney problems, maybe an infection. His back is killing him. He had to take Friday off work. We're supposed to go tomorrow. Like, John is one of the chief architects of our negotiation here. And he might be sick. But you know what? We're not depending on you, John. We're depending on God. But God still can deliver you from the nearest thing that a man might know could happen, maybe a, you know, maybe a kidney stone, to a woman given birth. Speaking of that, because we're going to pray for John, I'm standing right here looking at this beautiful couple who, along with my wife, came into my office today and said they had some news that they wanted to deliver. They're having a baby! And we want to pray for them that everything goes according to plan when God delivers that little baby that he's entrusted to you too. This is your family. This is your heritage. God's going to work it out. So I want you two to come over here. I want John, you to come over here. And I want to pray for this couple first just at the start of their journey. I want to pray for John. I want to pray for our church as well as we negotiate a price that we can live with. It's God's price for this church to be delivered in our hands so we can do ministry here. So right now in the name of Jesus, the one who delivers us, God, I pray that you would be with this couple. God, I pray that everything would go well that there wouldn't be complication, but at God, there would be a clean and a perfect delivery of a wonderful little baby that could be raised in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And one day that that child 
could hear a sermon about how when the church prays, God delivers. And that baby would take that to heart. And so God, Lord, as they go through the journey, help Chris to be wise with everything he says. Lord, watch over them and help them right now as they go forward in uncharted waters, not knowing what to expect. God bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, somebody else is praying. I just found out. No! John, you're going to have to wait wherever you're at. You've waited this long, bro. Taylor and Sean are pregnant. Let's pray. Let's pray. Ha ha. Ha. Lord, you're good. You will find some way to add to the church. <laughs> I read a book in Bible college called I Hate Witnessing. This is the most fun way to add to the church. God bless them. Give them increase. God, I pray that you would bind them together with cords that can't be broken so that they don't want to be set free from one another. But God, everything that they struggle with, set them free and give them a healthy pregnancy and deliverance so that they too can have another precious baby to add to their family. God, I pray, Lord, that your wisdom would be theirs in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, John, come on up here, buddy. And I know others, I know others are struggling and have been struggling. Lord, this is our brother John, and he needs prayer right now. Oh, here, let me stop, let me, let me stop for a second. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I've told you about Miamisburg First Assembly and some of the struggles that they've gone through. They have an interim pastor right now. This, this fits, okay? He's a former college, Bible college president. He's a great guy. I just met him last Tuesday. We were at a prayer meeting and a, and a brunch for pastors in the area, AG pastors in the area. And I sat right next to him because I wanted to meet him. God arranged that. And then he arranged for the leader of that meeting to ask us to pray for somebody that we didn't know. So I went to pray for him and he prayed for me. And you know what he prayed? that this year God would give us a healing ministry John the first person that I'm praying for since then with hands on application in the body of believers for a healing God's in control but he delivers when people pray in Jesus name right now God I pray that you would touch John and you would heal his body Take this infection, take this pain away, whatever it is. You know, God, you made him, you can heal him, deliver him, set him free, encourage him in every way, give him perfect health. In Jesus' name, I pray, and I leave it at that with full confidence that when your people pray, you deliver. You do as you please with your servants. So, Lord, I pray that you would do it in the mighty name of your Son. We make, we make no bones about it. John, the Lord is going to heal you. And we believe that. Yes. Amen, amen. Now listen, John, Lance, Steve, I know so many of you others, you're aware of, of the fact that we're going tomorrow to begin negotiations. We want to get it settled tomorrow. I hope that all the time that we spent getting ready for this thing falls apart when we walk in the door and they say we're going to give it to you or we're going to give it to you for the original price hey it can happen when people pray god delivers he if he delivered a person why couldn't he deliver a church property absolutely he can and then we're going to give him a spiel and probably end up paying more than no we're not john we're going to shut up <laughs> we're going to be like peter at the, sorry we're going to be like peter at the door we're going to be like peter at the door like shut up get inside let's take what God gives us know that he's in charge 
So Lord, now as a church, we all gather together at two minutes after 12, getting ready to get out and get to lunch, and we pray for this property. God, that you would deliver it right into our possession in a way that would amaze us so much so that we couldn't even believe it. God, your blessing. And I pray that you would continue to bless and, and you would deliver this church into our possession because we prayed, because you're a faithful God, because you're a sovereign God, and you brought us here. And God, you're not going to leave us here. You're going you're to set us free from all this junk hanging over our head, free to do the ministry that you've desired us to do. So that some of us, even from this place, might go to parts unknown. We might get out of Dodge and take the gospel from this place somewhere else. And God, it could all begin tomorrow. A whole new chapter in the life of our church. We've heard about babies being born. Lord, in some way, a church with a whole new outlook tomorrow could be born because of your favor. And so, God, that's what we're praying for. Give us favor, God, we pray in Jesus' name.